I'm Terry Boone for CATV, and we're doing another one of our programs uh, that include guests from the Winter Center for Indigenous Traditions. John Moody is uh, p someone that people around the Upper Valley know, and guests that we've had on the program before. And John, first let me introduce you to those who don't know you, uh, and just talk for very briefly about the Winter Center, and then we'll introduce our guests. Thank you, Terry. Um, I think I'm going to jump to introducing our guests and okay. skip the introduction to Winter Center. Most of us, I think, are familiar with it enough. Um, joining us today is, again, Joseph Ely Joubert um, from the Odenac Reserve, although he lives in, in New York, eastern New York now. An Abenaki elder, fluent speaker of the language, keeper of the language, and extraordinary uh, a guide for all of our efforts to um, revitalize and, and sustain the Abenaki language. And to his right um, is Jeff, Jesse Bruchak. Not Jeff, Jesse. <laughs> know him well, known this young man since the 80s. And he is um, also a um, fluent speaker of the Abenaki language, uh, one of our younger people who are working hard to um, to teach the language and bring the language into, um, into the next centuries in a good way, teaching his kids who are also nearby and, um, and others uh, this weekend, Abenaki families in this area, how to speak the language. Jesse does many other things. He's a singer and a writer and, um, and he, there's so many things I couldn't possibly do an hour on at all if we had the time. So thank Welcome you both, both for coming. Welcome to both of you for yeah. being here. Oh, thank you, Leonie. And today, uh, oh, go ahead, Terry. Well, wh let me, if I could, set up the, the overview of sure. John and I have talked about this, and he claims that most people know about the Winter Center. Well, I, think, I contend there are some that mm -hmm. don't know about the Winter Center. Uh, and so we'll, certainly at the end of the program, we'll get a uh, brief information about that. It is based locally and has been around for a long time. And John and, and his wife Donna are key to the Winter Center. The purpose of this first program that we're doing is to just do a brief overview in the next 45 minutes or so of Abenaki Native American place names. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me when I was driving that you sent the email me some information, and I thought driving down for old rip and raid radio announcers, we really need a pronunciation guide. Yeah. Uh, you guys do it effortlessly. You, Thankfully, you these, these guys are here to sure. straighten us so, out. So it, it's one thing people can sit around and say, Ottaquichi or Ampampanusik or Mascoma or these words, and then you start looking at the Abenaki right. word, and, that, right. and I'm thinking, boy, I really need a pronunciation guide. So I'm gonna try to stay out of the way and let uh, Jesse and Ely talk about these place names and, and uh, what you're doing with the language, the preservation of the language, and uh, expanding okay. it to young people. So, uh, okay. do we want to start with Jesse? Yeah, Jesse, I think, is going to welcome us in here with a traditional gre greeting. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, was asked, and it is a tradition among Northeastern people, I think among most Native peoples, to begin by welcoming, um, giving thanks and recognition to a new beginning, which we've begun here on your, your show again, which is, which is great to have the opportunity to share some of the knowledge that Eli and I carry. Um, one thing we've said in reference to knowledge, and as mentioned, Gladys Tantaquidgen um, should be thanked and the work that she's done in Connecticut. Um, and her, her, uh, her family, Harold Tantaquidgen, passed on and had in, 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 uh, on display always what he called a uh, circle of knowledge. And a circle of knowledge is something that is, is now continued through mediums like, like TV and, uh, and radio and books. And Eli and I have tried to be involved in everything we can. It's a great opportunity. Any opportunity for the language is wonderful. And we've seen that happen in generations of uh, Beneke people who've gone to places like Dartmouth and become published as early as 1830 with uh, Kinzui Awikigan and other books by Peter Paul Zokolain, which are so important to us. In whatever way we can, to pass on what we can share means that what we'll, our future generations will have will be, will be greater, hopefully. Maybe even greater than what we have now. A circle, of course, can always grow, um, and more people can be welcomed into it. So we welcome everyone in. And the four things that Harold taught to my family, to my father, and we've carried on, and Eli and I try and do really well, is just to recognize that in order to enter that circle, we first just have to do uh, one thing, and that's to open our ears 
and he pointed to the circle and you know the very first thing is to listen which is kita in the language listen kita and if we listen well enough um, we then can move on to the next step of a four-part circle which is uh, to kina and kina is to observe and if we've listened and observed things long enough, perhaps a story or how something is done, how a journey, how we get from a place or how we make a basket, um, we'll hopefully get to the third step in that circle, which is to mikwalda. And mikwalda is to put that knowledge that you've heard or seen into your mind and remember it. Um, and hopefully the next generation can do that with the language and with knowledge of place names and all these other things. It gives us an opportunity to be here, uh, help John and help you to get out the word of, of those things that we've heard and seen and, and remembered, luckily enough. And the last stage, obviously, to make it a circle, the last of the four steps, four being a really sacred number to Native people, um, the last is to tsabana, which literally means to share. Uh, so it's a wonderful opportunity to be here to take a little bit of what we've heard, what we've seen and remembered and share it with you. And, I'm far from perfect. There's a lot that I don't know, and there's a lot that I've forgotten, unfortunately. But still some remains within that circle, and we're trying to make it stronger. And a way to welcome people into that circle, a uh, circle of sharing, is with a greeting song. And often greeting songs long ago, when we look at the maps um, that John's worked on, and we look at the place names, we recognize that one of the most important namings is going to be the, uh, the rivers and the waters. And they were the highways and the network that connected the blood uh, lines of people all came together through those sacred waters. And, and uh, so it would be that a song like this would be sung usually on the side of a river as paddlers came by canoe mm -hmm. um, from community to community. And so this is one of many versions sung all across New England among Wabanaki peoples of a greeting song. And it would often be sung with a call and response. So people on shore would be calling out and saying, we welcome you. And people would, would then hear that and call back with their own song, saying, letting them know who they are by the melody which they sang. So this is a regional version that I, I learned actually at Odenak uh, many, many years ago. It just uh, goes like this. Yo guano de yo guano da Yo guano de yo guano da Gaiwani he ha yo yo he 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 Ha yo guano de yo guano da Yo guano de yo guano da Gaiwani he ha yo yo he 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Kuli payon. Welcome. Kitsilini. In, where do we want to start with some of the place names? We don't want to do it uh, with the um, English alphabetical. Let's do no, I, you, 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 a I, little, some I recognize, some I've never heard about. Well, a little introduction to the whole um, terrain of place names and Indian place names in New England and, and the country. It really begins with last year. The reason, one reason we're here is because uh, last year the people of Alaska, and that meant all the people of Alaska, where there's a large indigenous population of many different uh, uh, peoples, but also a lot of non-native people. And uh, they all voted essentially to bring back the name of Denali to uh, um, the largest, the tallest mountain in, in this hemisphere, which had been named Mount McKinley in honor, in honor of President McKinley, who was assassinated mm -hmm. in, the, uh, I think, 1900, wasn't it, or 1899? Early 19, yes. And, and uh, by the 20s, his, his uh, home state, I guess, had engineered in Congress to change the name of Denali to Mount McKinley. And as it turned out, very few people in Alaska thought it was a good idea, and they changed the name back officially to Denali, which is an Athabascan uh, name, which really, I think, mean, means our mountain, essentially, I think, the people's mountain in, in their language. 
And that set off an entire wave of interest in all of this. And in Vermont and New Hampshire, um, quietly, some remarkable things were taking place of the same kind. Um, just last fall, a little stretch of a brook up in Plainfield, New Hampshire, was renamed, um, was given an Abenaki name, essentially. Red, Red Spruce Brook, I think it was, wasn't it? And you folks, Ely and, and Jesse, helped to guide the process so that the name they put on it was recognizable in the language. Mm -hmm. And then um, the town of Rockingham, where Bellows Falls is, uh, the little city village of Bellows Falls, originally was named Kitsipantuk. And I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it, but it means Great Falls. And it's well known that that was the old Abenaki name for the place. And the town is really thinking about renaming um, that immediate area um, with the proper Abenaki place name. The town of Rockingham. Well, not either town. They're not talking about changing the town, but they're talking about officially naming the falls, mm -hmm. Buntuk, instead of either Great Falls or Bellows Falls or whatever. And over in New Hampshire, on the Pemigewasset River, there's a um, tributary of the Pemigewasset called the Baker River, and it runs through Plymouth and up into Rumney, New Hampshire. And the Rumney, New Hampshire Historical Society, which led by some Abenaki members, um, had a program last fall to begin the process of renaming the Baker River um, Red Salmon, Redfish River, or Salmon River, which is its its uh, original name. It's also the name that Squam Lake and uh, and several other places drew, drew their place name from. And this has all just come out of the community of people who live in the area, which includes Abenaki people and non-native people, much as it has in Alaska. So, in honor of that interest, and on both sides of the. Um, native, non-native line, I thought it would be a good idea to honor some of and understand some of the complexities of uh, place names in New England. The Connecticut River that we live on here in White River Junction area and runs from northern New Hampshire and Vermont all the way to the ocean is one of the few place names and river names in Indian country that is somewhat recognizable in its original form. And we'll get into the Abenaki derivation of that in a little while. But um, Winooski River is the only other Indian named, Abenaki named river, which is fairly close to what it was in the Abenaki days mm -hmm. when it was first uh, essentially copied down and repeated by non native folks. Uh, Mount Escutney, Mascoma River, uh, Ampampanusik, a lot of the local names here in the Upper Valley and many of the other names in the region, it's taken a long time to begin to understand what these names might have been. Atacuichi has been one of the last ones that we've um, started to think about. I don't know that we're even at the point of having understood what it is. And the point is, um, Often, if we're going to take a look at any of this, we need to do three things. We need to look at all the history and get all the versions of it. People probably today wouldn't know the name Waterquichi as the same name as Ataquichi, but most often in the early um, 1800s, late 1700s, that was the way it was written out. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you need to see the earliest renditions of all, of all this and find every source you can that says anything about what the name means. But the other thing that's crucial is to understand that, that and, and this has only been true in the last, I would say, 50 or 60 years, um, the ignorance of, of ethno-historians like myself and experts and historians in the non-native world was extraordinary about who was here and what these names, what language these names could be uh, found in. And now we know that the language is conventionally called the Abenaki language, um, and it is the language of essentially one people who lived and live today in Vermont and New Hampshire, Northern Mass, Southern Quebec, Western Maine. And there are many Abenaki who live in Northern New York and, and further afield, but that's the core of the old homeland. So um, arguably most of the, Aben of the place names here in this immediate area are probably going to be Abenaki. 
But understanding that and, and what language we're dealing with and having fluent speakers who can then help you through the process of, of um, understanding in more detail what that is. And Ely particularly and Jesse also have these, uh, have an extraordinary capacity to, to discuss the root meanings of some of these things and where, uh, where, the, uh, where the names come from. And one of the local names we've worked on a lot is uh, McBrook in Hanover. And it was just a, a, re a remarkably enlightening process to figure out the, the Abenaki name for that. But enough of this. Well, I'm curious. Introduction. That, yeah. Um, so. I'm curious about, let's just, if we can for a second, and we'll, yep. we'll, we'll, something like you say most people around here, even if they're relatively new to the area, right. know Connecticut and they've seen variations of the spelling of Connecticut. Right. Let's talk about that just for a minute. Okay. Before we can, and and sure. the Abenaki word for Connecticut is? Kwani uh, to cook is the way we would say it. It's Kwani to cook. And what you have is the first part of it is Quinn, which means uh, long, could also mean tall, it just has something to do with a uh, length, Quinn. And a uh, connecting sound, Quinny, that I has no meaning. Took comes from the word for uh, wave. To go is a wave. Mm -hmm. So Quinny Tukuk, in that case, Quinny Tuk means flowing or, or you know, the movement. Mm -hmm. um, so a long flow. And then the last sound is K in the language, Quinny Tukuk which gives it location, and we call that a locative. So it's be like at, the long flow. The T uh, pronunciation is often seen more in the southern New England dialects. Mm -hmm. So you would imagine that the first uh, renderings of Connecticut would have probably come from more southern uh, groupings of uh, Abenaki speakers, or perhaps mm -hmm. even Wampanoag speakers, where we see things like Massachusetts. Um, as well, where T is being used for the locative to represent the locative. But it does the same thing. It's, it makes it mean Connecticut literally is at the long flow. And we would say today in, the, in, the, in what we would call the modern dialect of Western Abenaki, which is arguably almost identical to the one uh, that was met at least uh, around the time uh, when it was being written down in 1830, very little has changed. It would be pronounced Quinny to cook, mm -hmm. to cook at the long flow. If we think about the the, the uh, U.S. colonies in, in the uh, 18th century, or even going back before that, would some of these Abenaki words for rivers and areas have been established way back before that? I would imagine rivers certainly. Um, one thing you'll see, which there's a lot of things that could be considered problematic, but they're <laughs> more cultural than problematic, <laughs> is that river names don't necessarily represent one river, and they don't necessarily stay in one place. Sometimes the same um, name will be used in several different rivers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes even as people move, as their community would move or be displaced, they would take the river name with them, hmm. um, which is fascinating. So you play, see names like uh, Alyssa Guntakuk, Aristogush, and all these different versions that are basically the same word following uh, Abenaki speak, speaking peoples all across New England and right up into what is today called Odenak or St. Francis mm -hmm. on the Alissaguntakuk, uh, mm -hmm. as the river is called. And while these uh, names have changed in many ways, they have very similar origins. Even among the Mi'kmaq and Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, we see um, versions of names that are very similar namings of rivers. Mm -hmm. So I think there is an identity that we have to rep uh, recognize when we're talking about place names. In fact, tribal, what we call tribes, a lot of times we're not named by uh, what we think of ethnicity. Instead, they're named by location. And the most prominent feature of a location would be the river. As I said at the beginning, it was, the, it was what connected. It was what you traveled on. So people often, what we consider as tribal groups, are all part of the, the greater Abenaki communities. They're just being named by the rivers on which they live. Mm -hmm. um, well, listening to you describe that, and I think about my limited travels in the, in the maritime provinces of Canada, 
and many, I'm reluctant to say most, but many of the rivers have names like Restigouche yeah. and Cascapedia and Matapedia and Miramichi and all, those are all salmon rivers. And so I, I, I'm, I'm just curious about why those names have been preserved and, and pronoun pronounced similarly by locals, mm -hmm. non-native, uh, if you will, mm -hmm. and, and less of that down into northern New England and certainly southern New England and, and the mid-Atlantic. I think it's about comparable here, hmm. and I think for the same reasons. I mean, th there really wasn't much clarity in ethno-historians and historians about who was here. And there's more clarity in, in Mi'kmaq country, Mi'kmaq country out of Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. Everyone kind of knew the Mi'kmaq people were there. But nonetheless, there were always Abenaki people here. I like to say that every town in Vermont and New Hampshire, western Maine, even eastern New York, in northern Massachusetts to this day still has Abenaki people living in it and did throughout the, the, the last uh, 400 years or so with the arrival of non-native people. Not necessarily well known. The histories weren't articulated very clearly. Um, as I said, at the last time we did a program, we just figured out there was an Abenaki canoeing village here right in White River Junction in hmm. the 1760s when non-native people first arrived. The non-native accounts of the village have come out recently, but it's amazing that that is not part of White River Junction's history. Mm -hmm. I mean, being a junction of essentially mm -hmm. what became a, a junction of railroad interests and all kinds of folks, the transportation nature, you know, hub nature of White River is probably very ancient. But we just stumbled into this in the last oh, 15 or so years. Mm -hmm. Now. Local Abenaki families that I've known always poke me in the ribs and say, yeah, John, well, you know, we're just waiting for you to wake up. And it, shut up, too, as Jesse said in the beginning of the program. You know, listen. Like, listen first, not last. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's the nature of it. And, and there were many, many accounts of Abenaki people guiding the founding of Dartmouth, guiding uh, early settlers in town. Uh, we just did a new Norwich history in which it's clear that most of the families that survived down to present day, the, the uh, early settlers' families, married in with the Abenaki and consider themselves to be Abenaki today. And they're very, very knowledgeable about, about the uh, origin of some of the place names and all. So, you know, we should get into it a little bit because it's a big story and we only have, to, you know, this brief hour and then maybe one more program to... to tap into this. We should do a call-in program, too, and see what people want to know about. <laughs> I'm and not by sure. The way, I'm not sure about that. By the way, no. Terry, one thing we want to make sure we get to this program, I hope, is Makawi, because we'll, we'll touch on that. Your, yes. Yes. You know, the place name you're associated with has yes. a very we'll instructive history in relationship to making sure you know what you're dealing with. Right. Ely, we're, we're keeping you quiet. Yes. Uh, let's uh, give Ely a chance. Okay. I'm, uh, yeah. Based on what you said about Alsigantikuk, and you wanted to know, what, what is it that you wanted to know about Alsigantikuk? Well, I'm just, uh, one, I look at this list, and, mm -hmm. it's, and, I, and if I struggle with it, looking mm -hmm. at the list of names, I, I think, without you here, I can sit in my living room and come up with my pronunciation. I think, mm -hmm. no, that's not right. Okay. I need a pronunciation guide. So okay, not just in pronunciation, but also what it means. Yes. He will tell you that it means empty cabin river. I will tell you. It means clam river, and alsi is a root word for clam. Alsigantikuk. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's there's something that comes through all the way through, and who wins? Mm -hmm. We still got his and mine, mm -hmm. but that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a, a clam river, oyster river, still named that, and Oyster Bay in Durham, New Hampshire. Uh, mm. Feeding out in the Great Bay. You named Alsigan? Yeah. 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 Ah, same. And Alsigan ah, ah, means ah, oyster shows. or clams. Ah, so. Not all is lost, Ely. Ah, yeah. ah, ah. <laughs> yeah. There it is. Yeah. Okay. And it, so, is, it is those, those all, that's another great uh, point within the, within the language itself. There are often multiple interpretations right. of the same sounds and the mm -hmm. same roots. And um, so we, we then need to have someone to turn to and we need to look at the history of the community and as John has done research and others have done research into these names it may sound like it's the same name 
it may look the same to us who, who you know, haven't ever seen it before, and those who have been familiar with it or carried it may have a different story as to what the translation means. And to respect that and do that work in place name work is really important, mm -hmm. to turn to the local indigenous people, um, the people who may be carrying that name. And it may have come to them with a different meaning than even those of us who speak the language and come from a different community may hear. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's true of a lot of things within the language when, when, we, when we are speakers. Just being a speaker isn't enough. Um, there's more. There are many elements that come into it, and, and certainly history and a recognition of the community's relationship with place has to be figured in when we try and determine what is the actual meaning. And at the end of the day, as I think Eli just said perfectly, there may not just be one answer. It may actually be that this place has multiple meanings within even the community itself yeah. to people, and that might be why the name was so perfect for that place because it could speak to more members of the community and make it more recognizable or in a more important place for them. And so its name may have many layers of meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the complicated nature of any language, but certainly in, in a polysynthetic language like uh, Beneke is, there's so much meaning that can be drawn forth from words. And as you, you mentioned, some of these words are pretty big. When we look in New Hampshire and we just drive around, we see it's funny, Lee and I can't go anywhere without, we get to Maine, we go visit our friends there and work with the language uh, among our Penobscot friends and Maliseet friends and just driving and like, what does that mean? What does that mean? You know, mm -hmm. Kagui and we just, you know, think and, and, and ponder it and mm -hmm. then ask them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're right on and sometimes we're, we weren't close at all. Huh. Yeah. There's what? something I want to explain though. Like in Vermont, okay, that's, you, you look at the state of Vermont, I think there was four, five or six different tribes mm -hmm. among the Abeniki, they which spoke their own language too. They used root words, but they did speak the, it. The different tribes had their own language. Yeah. Right, using the roots of right. the language. But what's happening now is we might look at, uh, what was that, uh, the, the gorge that you said? Quichi, Quichi Gorge. Yeah. Atacuichi, yes. Yeah. Uh, the Atacuichi River mm -hmm. is, right. is a longer version of of, and that's, of course, you just can't drove across them. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing is in between two sides, the gorge. Ah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a place that quid, quitao them in is fear, and mm -hmm. quidongan is your throat. Quid, and then quidado means it sinks. Mm -hmm. Quid, so the root quid has something to do with sinking um, or going down in between, and um, uh, uh, quits. Could definitely have something to do with it being it could just mean gorge mm -hmm. and right. ata means a place like adali mm -hmm. the place of the gorge could be the literal meaning ata quichi, ata mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. and, you, and you'll remember terry that i sent out a, a a little memo to you saying that my worst guess of it and i'll say it that way was that it really referred to um, this being a sort of a backdoor route to go over to Deer Leap and over to, to um, Otter Creek mm -hmm. because I'm really waving in the wind when it comes yeah, to Yeah, when I saw so, that and I'm thinking, I'm looking, at, I'm trying to, I didn't get out my atlas, I'm thinking Otter Creek, why would they, you know, I'm trying to think about a shortcut to get to Otter Creek on that, but yes. I've got some pretty good um, historical accounts that that's precisely what it was and what it is in the 18th century, mm -hmm. but that doesn't necessarily mean anything to Ely and Jesse and the, mm -hmm. and the meaning of the word. That is just a, one small baby step in the process. Mm -hmm. what, 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 say that again. Well, it's, it, you know, I put it in this, I don't know that I can pronounce it correctly, but um, I think I put it on here. That's, that's what I put down. Odawasa onagwigwistuk which is basically... A, <laughs> that was, yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> that was the one I couldn't... <laughs> Unigiku tuk is uh, otter, and then again that tuk, unigiku is otter. Tuk is from wave, and then so unigiku tuk would be an otter river or an otter creek. Mm -hmm. um, unigiku tukok would be at the otter creek, and um, odawasa means you pass through it. Asa is to go, osa is to go. <laughs> Uda, yeah, onda. We'll and I think my re yeah. when John sent that to me, that my reaction, it, yeah. my reaction to that was it, when it didn't make sense to me. I was thinking strictly in 
21st century or 20th century going in on a road, driving mm -hmm. from here to Otter Creek or Otter River. Right. And, and, but listening to you describe it now, they were traveling in canoes and traveling by land. And portaging and carrying. Portaging carries, and yeah. going. Yeah. So the, 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 the location of a gorge would be important well, to know. Well, yeah, yeah, I like their carry, version yeah. much better than mine, but that's always true. <laughs> um, is that you know, like Oda Wosa is almost like a carry, that term. What is the... Yeah, I mean, this came out of um, days, That's Gordon thinking. days. Yeah, carry. it's almost it's like a, a carry, right, to go over it. Yeah. You're carrying with packs, you know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it almost implies walking, and Atacuichi route is actually is walking, only start. during uh, high high water times is that a really a canoeable river. It's not a logical way to go. For about a week. Right. The, two, mm -hmm. the two ways to go, um, the major roads are south of us on the Black River in Springfield going mm -hmm. over the Hyde Atlantia. That's the common way to go um, in the old days, um, the Crown Point Road route, or to go all the way up and over the White River, one of the branches, and end up on the Winooski River there. Mm -hmm. That's another major way. The Deerfield Raid, after the Deerfield Raid, most of the captives were taken that route. Mm -hmm. But again, um, this is, you know, um, there are a lot of potential meanings to these names. And Hatakwichi has been interpreted as Celtic, Gaelic. Uh, there was actually a local person who wrote down in the late 19th century that a Penobscot person um, said it meant swift running stream, essentially, mm -hmm. which is what's made it into the, into, the, um, into the history books as being the most likely source, mm -hmm. which is interesting because Penobscot and Abenaki languages are pretty close. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, you know, I think this week when Ely and Jesse are, and I are here, you know, together, we'll keep thinking about this until we figure it out. Mm -hmm. And then ideally we'll find an early source that says, this is what it means. And where would you now, find... Now, you got to remember, too, though, they remember this, because I've been around and it, it, people are naming things. And number one, they don't... They're not speakers, so they mispronounce it. Yes. It gets written down in history, and it says it's a Beneke, and it is not. Yes. Okay? There's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of places named that are... Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, John touched on this, and uh, let's try to get this my attempt at humor out of the way here for a couple <laughs> of minutes. Uh, there is a trout fishing club that's been around for about 100 years. You, you two may have heard this before when you were here. And the name of the trout club is Mekawi. That's the local pronunciation. Mm -hmm. And there was a local newspaper reporter who did a, a story on the club a, f a few years ago. And I was one of the people that he talked with. And I, I planted this because I knew I would get John Moody to respond to it. <laughs> I said, Mekawi is just an old Abenaki word that means no fish. And with, uh, I made that up. I just <laughs> improvised that. And sure enough, it got like floating a fly. For it, it got John to rise. And it wasn't a week later. <laughs> and a week later, John saw me on the street. Well, yeah, and he gave me a lot of grief about that. You know? And I knew it would get that response out of him. I know, the, I know that, that word, the name of that club, has nothing to do with Native people. It had to do with somebody who had this Scottish view. And she came up with a term 100 years ago, of we Mecca. And they flipped it around yeah. and made it. And, and so it was just too tempting for me not to do that and, and know that I would get. So, but then John found a word. I think it made him do some research. And he found <laughs> a word comparable to that. That's how we got into this discussion. Inque. Part Inque. Inque. Right, and, yeah. and meaning what? What does emque mean? Red. Red. Yeah. Red. Huh. Yeah. And red would be the salmon. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm intrigued to see this, where you have a little brook, or the Baker River, which is not a little brook, but it's a smaller river, relatively speaking, right. and it's a tributary to the Pema Jawasset. Right. And I'm intrigued to see that, in fact, you're talking about is it being red salmon or red river. So right. that red fish would river. tell me Squamon, that there yeah. was, a, it was a salmon run there a long time ago. Yep. Yeah. And uh, the Clyde River, too, up in northern Vermont yes. that drains um, into Lake Mimpermagog. I don't want to draw into talking about fishing. and that's a, so, but let's, let, let, let's You talked about uh, uh, there might be five different tribes and five different languages, but surely they, they were able to, if the words were similar, uh, it must have helped in their, I don't want to say disputes, but, but certainly in communication and, and how they... Well, yes, because... Here, I'll give you one of the names. Scatacook, uh, okay? Scatacook Indians mm -hmm. were in this area, mm -hmm. okay? And then they went to New York. But while they were in this area, they had to talk to somebody down 
in the southern part of Vermont, mid Vermont, upper Vermont. They, mm -hmm. And where do you talk? It's on the riverway. The, mm. the riverways are like arteries, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. they keep things breathing, keep mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. alive, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Mascoma, who ended up with his name on the river that's across the Connecticut River from us in Lebanon, drains up into, flows up down from the upper reaches of Enfield and all, um, was an actual Sokwaki man uh, from Sokwakik downstream in northern Mass and southern Vermont, New Hampshire. Uh, well known, showed up in, in colonial records, mm -hmm. usually as Masama, M A S S A M A H, instead of Mascoma. But it's pretty, pretty clear that he was actually an Abenaki leader. Um, in fact, Jesse, I think, told me that if you take his name in Abenaki and make sense of it, it means. Great chief. Great chief. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That's a great mm -hmm. chief. What is it again, Jesse? Masongamo. Masongamo. Yeah, and in, yeah. in Penobscot, so, which is a really closely related dialect, um, it changes to um, Mascoma, that coma. So it's more related, more closely related to Penobscot. I think the division now that survived is what we have uh, is Penobscot, which is kind of a remnant of Eastern Abenaki, and then um, what, what is uh, we call Alnumbal and Dwawongan, people call Western Abenaki. But in between the space between these two communities, people, you know, there's different variations in how people spoke, just like if you go from Scotland to England, there's accents. And while we may call these two different languages, in fact, they're dialects of the same language. And then, then if we were to travel in this direction towards Maine, I could travel the same way down towards Scaticoke, and we're going to see those changes in the language occur as well. Um, so it would be very, very easy for me to communicate, as Elise said, as I travel along the river, I could go to the next community, and we're pretty much going to be mutually speaking exactly the same way. But if I go, you know, uh, you know Portage and a few rivers up the way, I'm going to find some people whose accent has, has changed considerably. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still going to be able to communicate. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even today, Ely and I travel up and uh, go over to Indian Island, and, and with Penobscot, it's not hard at all to understand. Mm -hmm. There are some differences. We go a little further. For those who, like me who don't know, where is Indian Island? Indian Island is uh, right uh, near Bangor, Maine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, right out, you know, right in basically Orono. It's on the river. Yeah. yeah. Penobscot River. Mm -hmm. Right on the Penobscot River. Yeah. Um, an example of just intonational changes that happen in the language is, is nice to hear. If I were to just say, um, what is that called in Abenaki? It's a Kagwi Liwitamen. They would say in Penobscot, keg hmm. So to someone who doesn't speak the language, that sounds like something very, very different. But if you spell it out and write it, it's spelled pretty much the same way. Mm -hmm. So in many cases, reading our languages sometimes becomes easier, but that becomes problematic because everybody chooses to write them differently. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about place names, it's not even native people usually who are writing these. It's sometimes Dutch, sometimes English, sometimes French, each with their own orthographies yeah. and their own way of hearing. Some argue that a lot of these R's that end up on everything were just the way it was being heard. Hmm. Um, some argue that the languages themselves made a major shift from R to L at a certain point. Hmm. But Merrimack. it may, may have just been, yeah, that uh, instead of Aristogu, it was Alist all the time, but it was heard more as ar uh, that rolling R. Mm -hmm. It still is. Like uh, if I make, uh, French people will just call it Rishtagush. Yeah. So it's a a right in between. Hmm. And again, that comes down to who's listening. And when the person who's listening isn't a f uh, native speaker of that language, it creates even more issues. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, though, you know, to get back to my initial point, in some cases, we're very able to communicate even today while we're more isolated than we probably were long ago, I think pre-contact the travel and the network and communication was probably much greater between people because it was a part of survival using the rivers as a network, probably going all the way out um, across the country. There was a network. And within that, each community would have to travel a certain amount of distance. And within that space of Algonquin speaking people, um, there was a great deal of mutual intelligibility. Um, between these dialects, which have now been divided up and called different languages, mm -hmm. which can be separate, can separate us, uh, I think 
it's important to recognize their uniqueness and their unique qualities as their own language, but it's also important to recognize how together we can be strong as well when we realize we're very closely related to the Lenape and we're very closely related to the Mi'kmaq. In fact, if I were to take the word, I'd say Lenape in Lenape. I'd say al Nunba, same word. It means a human in Abenaki. al Nabe in Penobscot. Mm -hmm. al Nap in Maliseet. al Nip in Passamaquoddy and El Nu in Mi'kmaq, and that eventually becomes Inu among what we have called the Eskimo. Mm. But you hear it's that same word, and then if I were to go mm. the other way out west, it becomes Anabe. Al Nabe becomes Anabe among the Anishinaabe, mm -hmm. uh, a central Algonquin speaking people. I, I'm speculating here that listening to you talk about the differences, of the, that this is, has it been an issue? in recognition of certain tribes in dealing with the federal government. Absolutely. I just have to imagine that that, that, that has bogged down yeah. some efforts for recognition. And I know there's been something going on for a long time uh, in, in northeastern Vermont. Yeah. The, the argument is, are these separate tribes or are these, and it's a big, even in Connecticut among uh, the Pequot, there's different commute part, there's different, there's a recognized Pequot community and a non-recognized Pequot uh, kind of, uh, famous right here, we have the Abenaki, who are referred to as Abenaki in Vermont, now state recognized finally. And then we have the Abenaki, or as it's pronounced Abenaki uh, in Canada, who have two, re two reservations and are recognized by the federal government there. Yes. So even within that, those divisions of, is it just a, a, a splinter branch of a larger group or is it a community in and of itself? Mm -hmm. These are arguments that do become um, issues with the government. and. I would argue, as John said, that in every one of these communities there are remnants, and in some places there have been existing um, individual communities of a larger nation, that nation being the Abenaki nation, mm -hmm. having many, many different lo locations of uh, families and smaller communities who have lived in, in what we would call a tribe. Mm -hmm. Wombanaki. Yeah, the Wombanaki Confederacy mm -hmm. is a confederacy of these many small groups which are really family-based groups and they have regional economies mm -hmm. or had them and some in, in ways have existed. If I could ask you to listen, could you talk for a second about the, the difference between tribe and band? Yeah, and it's, it's complicated. Yes, I, can't, it's I said at the beginning, I will share what I know and what, I, what, I, what my perception of these things are. The terminology is one that can be argued in court, of course, mm -hmm. and it can recognize a, a community, and recognition for a community on the federal level can mean so much. The mm -hmm. Mashpee Wampanoag, of course, just gained federal recognition, and now they have an enormous amount of uh, interest from Malaysia and you know, casinos going in, and <laughs> right. we see that pattern. So parsing language mm -hmm. is huge when we say, is it a band, is it a tribe, is it a, you know, what is it? Mm -hmm. uh, band is more commonly applied to Canadian people's by the governments. Yes. Yeah, yeah but it's all first. by the government. And, yeah. and the government in the U.S. tends to call bands tribes, and they mean roughly the same thing mm -hmm. in the non-native, you know, governmental world, roughly. But in Abenaki, the word is entirely a nation, tribe, band, and, and family are all linked. That's right. And, and it's an entirely, really, a different concept. I don't know if you... I agree. The, you guys want to talk about that? Family is what we are. A family is what? A band. A family is a tribe. Mm -hmm. Okay? Family. My aunts, my uncles. That's what we use. Mm -hmm. Okay? I don't think you can find tribe in the book, can you? Have you ever seen mm -hmm. tribes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's many families together. Literally, yeah. it means many it's families. families. The <laughs> translation right. of tribe is many families living together. Thank you. That's right. how we mm -hmm. say it in the language. And, and so, uh, <laughs> listening to you s just describe it as families, families are different size. Yes. You might have a family yes. in northern Vermont and, and southern Quebec mm -hmm. that is smaller than a family in central Vermont mm -hmm. and New York, eastern mm -hmm. New York. Mm -hmm. then, no then you have to look at this way too. As let's say I'm on the Connecticut River, right? I may have two places I cherish on that river, one to the north and one to the south. Mm 
-hmm. I may change my whole mm -hmm. location yep. two times a year. Mm -hmm. I love it. And they love me. I don't own it. <laughs> it was historically uh, really, really hard because that's exactly what happened is people were traveling for a long period between Scaticoke, Massisquoi, and what's now called Odenac on the St. Francis River. Mm -hmm. So you had the same people being registered and then sometimes maybe collecting monies um, from the King of France mm -hmm. and playing the game that way. But mm -hmm. it was a natural pattern of, oh, this is a Massisquoi Indian. And then you see the same name, oh, this is a, a Neridjwak Indian over here in Maine. Mm -hmm. You see the same name, oh, this is an Odenak. Just depended on the season. He, or, mm. he, or, or incursion, or Who paid disease, the most? or so many yeah, things. The Plasso family is, is a classic example of that. Francis became St. Francis at Missisquoi, northwestern Vermont. The famous Homer St. Francis yes. is one of these. But his family name shows up first in Soquaquique down in Northern Mass yeah. uh, when his mother and grandmother were trading with the white folks about whether they could <clears throat> live in certain areas. And she wrote her name down on a couple of kind of deeds leases in those days. And it mm -hmm. was, she was listed as being uh, Francis's um, mother. Mm -hmm. Now, in New Hampshire, it's Plasua, mm -hmm. which is the ab the uh, Abenaki way of saying Francis, the English or French name, back into India. F's become P's. There's, <clears throat> there's no a Plasois F. mountain, there's a Plasois bridge, yeah. there's a famous series of events that happened in the late 1700s. So you see, just with that name alone, how you could get into um, a lot of variations on the theme. And the Saplasois or St. Francis family, there are St. Francis's that live in the Upper Valley. There's yes. a family in this immediate area that's yes. uh, connected to the one from Missisco. Mm -hmm. And that's really the tip of the iceberg. You'd be amazed. There's a butternut family, Bagun family, and they have hundreds of variations on those names. Mm -hmm. And the Kantukuk River is Baguntukuk, uh River, which means, roughly speaking, the butternut river. And uh, there's all kinds of things like that. Although I must say about Mascoma that the Abenaki, as far as I know, except maybe in the case of Pico Mountain, might be named for an Abenaki, um, uh, ancient Abenaki person. But by and large, that's a non-native naming process. So if Mascoma River is named for Mascoma, and I, we believe it is, it was the non-native folks who did that. And that's fairly common in Vermont and New Hampshire. Skitchewag Mountain was named for a Wadso family member, a leader who was um, living near there in Springfield, New Hampshire, or Springfield, Vermont, excuse me, in the, mm -hmm. in the late 1700s. And um, there are several other places in Vermont and New Hampshire that bear the name. Molly Ock at Malls Rock up at Lake Ambagog. Um, the f most famous one in New England is probably Greylock Mountain. That's named for an, an adopted Abenaki uh, warrior named Wawa Nolwat. Mm -hmm. Wawa Nolwat. We know that family. Wawa Nolwat. I'm, I'm from that family. And mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. his descendant here. Mm -hmm. so. John, you're talking about Mount Greylock. Most right. people have driven around know about Mount Greylock. You're mm -hmm. saying, Ely, that that is your family? His name, Mount Greylock, Greylocks, was Wawa Nolwat. And you want to tell them what it means? Yeah, my, my, um, my first uh, instructor in the language, Elie's mother, mm -hmm. um, Cecile Wawanolet, uh, is a descendant. Um, so uh, that family comes down to this day. The language was carried down um, through her, Elie, to me, and, uh, and my kids. And the family itself, there, again, even the family names, just like place names, there are multiple translations as to what they could mean. Mm -hmm. Some say that it refers to him having a, a gray patch or a white patch of hair on his head. Mm -hmm. uh, and others, as Elise saying, onda, which in the language means that it's not correct. Wano bon flon is a word that's similar, and it means he throws them off his path. Mm -hmm. And that is the family story, mm -hmm. is that it, it was that Greylock for almost a, a century, which is unbelievable, but if you look at the historic accounts of his life, he is causing havoc for a big chunk of time, and people just can't find him. He's hiding in the swamps mm -hmm. and cutting up into Canada and deep in into the, the Siskoi mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and coming down into, into parts of New England. And um, yeah, he's really a, a resistance fighter. Um, 
for the Abenaki people, and it was a big time. A, a lot of things were happening, and the Abenaki were greatly feared under Greylock. And it's it's uh, it's wonderful to see that that legacy continues in a place like like Mount Greylock, and, mm. and to have uh, an understanding that the name continues as the and the family continues. So that I think that's a good point for us to break, unless we have about a minute left. Unless there's something, this is going to we're going to do a second program. Uh, if there's anything we need to slip in, because I want to ask a qu follow-up question, but I'll save it for the mm -hmm. beginning of our next program. Uh, if, if you've tuned in late and you you don't know who these guys are sitting around talking, my name's Terry Boone. Uh, to my left, John Moody from the Winter Center for Indigenous Traditions, Eli Joubert and Jesse Bruchak are our guests today. We do this every year or so. And we've just touched on a little bit of uh, Abenaki Native American place names uh, around Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, Eastern New York, and Southern Canada. And there's a second part coming up. Thank you for watching and hope that you will see the second part.